Morning, everybody. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> So uh, yes, I, I'm an architect. I'm going to talk today kind of from the architect level of, uh, you know, a technical level and try to give a more, uh, maybe a high level view um, of the landscape that we're seeing in terms of especially electrification, electric, uh, all electric buildings. Um, I'm also going to end with uh, a few minutes talking about some emerging issues as we continue to electrify buildings, some of the next level concerns that we're trying to address in some of our projects. So just quickly, EHDD is an a architecture firm here based in San Francisco. We've been around for about 70 years. Uh, one of our big areas of focus is a, this idea of a climate positive future for buildings. And so we're looking at both operating energy, operating carbon, as well as embodied carbon of materials um, and doing carbon assessments of all our projects uh, as we go. So as part of that, um, we've been working on net zero energy buildings now for about 15 years. We designed and built the first certified net zero energy commercial building in the country down in San Jose. I think it was built around 2005, a uh, small office building. And since that time, we've been scaling up, doing projects like the one you see here, the Packard Foundation for kind of cutting edge clients who are willing to kind of go out on the leading edge and increasingly doing projects that are net zero for developers who see a financial, who kind of capture the financial benefits of um, leasing structures that encourage net zero energy operation. What's, uh, what's been interesting for us, so w when we started doing net zero energy buildings, it was, a it was really focused um, around addressing climate change. And by almost default, those were all electric buildings. All of the net zero energy buildings we've done are all electric so that we can trade off one-to-one -one electrons that we're producing on the roof for um, energy that we're um, consuming uh, you know, during winter or nighttime. So early on, we really had to design, well, we, we always design for energy efficiency for many reasons. One of them early on is that the uh, heat pumps um, it was really kind of uncertain maybe 10, 15 years ago just how well these air source heat pumps were working. We were really trying to reduce the loads to handle the, the heating loads. Um, and we were able to do that by doing things like improving the envelope with triple glazing that actually on a first cost basis paid for uh, themselves by reducing the HVAC systems and ultimately also reducing the PVs we needed to reach net zero. Since that time, so that was around 2007, and then, as everyone in this room knows, one of the most amazing things that's been happening in the last decade or so is just how fast the electrical grid in California and all over the country has been decarbonizing. This is an image of the overall U.S. Electric, electricity grid um, and the amount of uh, carbon emissions um, in that grid. So our focus has really shifted, just like I think Danny was saying uh, for the California Energy Commission, net zero energy buildings are great. You know, we still do some, but it's really about going all electric if we're really focused on carbon emissions, just because over time we can just drive down uh, emissions rate just by um, kind of supporting the state's uh, ongoing renewable energy portfolio standard and seeing our buildings just improve in their performance. This is kind of backed up or reinforced by research by many parties. This is research by NRDC showing um, a typical 2019 code compliant building mixed fuel versus um, electric. So on, the, on your left, on your left, you see the um, you know, a gas building um, or mixed fuel building that by 2045 will still have a significant amount of um, carbon emissions every year for operating energy versus on the right, an electric building, which if we do what we say we're going to do as a state, should be zero emissions by 2045. So this has kind of become our, our real focus as a, as a practice. So I think the big question probably on some of your minds and certainly on a lot of people's minds these days is, as you know, Berkeley bans gas, and now I think 20-something cities have banned gas. Are we really ready to do this now? I mean, it's a nice idea. Um, is it really practical? So I'm 
I'm here to say that it really is. So we're seeing it just based on what's happening in the marketplace, and we're seeing just a tremendous amount of buildings, both built and in design, that are all electric. So I'm going to do a very kind of fast armchair tour of what's out there right now in the nine counties that are all electric buildings, just to give a sense that we're seeing it across every building type. Um, and uh, we'll just get started here. So we're going to start with some of our projects, and then we'll show a lot of our um, peer firms. But this is actually a project in Boulder, Colorado, all electric spec office building. Uh, our Exploratorium project here, which is obviously a complex building type, it's all electric, 200,000 square feet. Uh, a number of school projects um, in up in Marin and um, Napa, other places, Mark Day School. Here in San Francisco, Lake Wilmerding High School, we just completed a uh, all electric addition and renovation. We're in Country Day School. We actually just yesterday got uh, lead platinum for this project, so we're really excited about that. All electric. And um, other architects, uh, this is WRNS Group. This is a project in Sonoma that includes an all electric dining facility that you can actually see kind of through the glass there. Um, I know, I think Todd Bell later is going to talk about that. Um, in general, the, the issue of all electric cooking. Public schools are doing it as well here at SF Unified. And then moving on to more um, office buildings at a bigger scale, there's a lot of great examples. Um, uh, Ted's firm, Goodman and Blavouet, designed the Smut Operations building that's 360,000 square feet some years back. Projects in San Francisco, like 270 Brannan. Um, in San Jose, both built like this 500 Centena row, but also projects that are uh, in design phases now that are kind of really nice architecture. And, um, and then this project has gotten a lot of press recently, the Adobe headquarters that's planned uh, for all electric design construction. At SFO, they recently built this project, the admin office building that's all electric. Uh, a lot of renovations, I'm going to show a few now, renovations either gut or primarily, um, you know, major renovations that are uh, capping the gas lines and going all electric. And what's interesting is that a lot of these are really developer driven. So 435 Indio is a spec office building, 380 North Pastoria spec office building. And the developers are doing this because it costs less money to do it. That's the only reason that they would do it. <laughs> um, Housing, uh, a tremendous amount of all electric housing projects um, built now, and it's really a, a lot of them are the you'll notice affordable is is listed a lot because it really is cheaper for the affordable housing developers to to build it all electric and for their tenants as well. And so they're really looking out for the long term financial viability and they're choosing to go all electric. And this is before obviously if it's built, it's really before a lot of the increasing incentives when it was kind of harder to do it, they were still doing it all electric. So here in Sunnyvale, <clears throat> in Alameda, San Francisco, some larger projects, kind of high-rise affordable housing. Uh, Methune's an architecture firm that's been doing a lot of it, and they're finding on, on their projects it's almost always cost neutral to go all electric. Oops, sorry. Um, more projects planned in San Francisco. Treasure Island, again, San Francisco, central heat pump water heating. And as Danny mentioned, you know, it's been a real challenge for our engineers for a little while to figure out how to work around this. But it's just great that those improvements are being made. And it's, I think it's going to make this process even easier to, uh, to do these multifamily projects. Mountain View as well, 101 units uh, currently in bidding. Oakland. San Jose, Walnut Creek, again, Alameda, and then up as well, uh, up in the north uh, in Sonoma, there's some projects uh, that are uh, planned in Napa as well. One of the real uh, kind of early movers on this has been universities, both at Stanford that did a big central uh, plant upgrade, and but University of California in general uh, they have a policy in place for over a year now that every project, no new buildings are allowed to have gas in any of their campuses all over the state. 
and that we've been seeing this uh, across, so this is across all building types, um, both uh, student housing, like this project here at UC Davis, also UCSF has a project that I think is just opened um, in Mission Bay. And even a lot of the P3 uh, public-private partnership projects that are developer-driven, you know, cost-driven, uh, those projects almost universally are going all electric because, again, it's just cheaper for these developers to build them um, all electric. Um, and it happens to be more efficient as well. But even more complex buildings, like uh, laboratory buildings, here's one at LBNL that's complete, that's um, all electric and a project that's in design as well up at LBNL. And I know Ted's firm, uh, Guman and Blavouet, has other examples as well. Uh, an interesting zero energy lab down in La Jolla. And some medical office buildings as well, and, and it's starting to uh, get into the hospital market. I don't personally do that. I know maybe Ted can talk to hospitals. I know that's a special case, but there's certainly all electric hospitals that are that are in design or construction or maybe perhaps even uh, built by now. And then finally, uh, this is an interesting case. The Bradley Terminal uh, LAX is all electric. And as we all know, in, in um, airports, there's a lot of food service, a lot of different kinds of food service. There's Chinese, there's you know pizza, pizza ovens, uh, Mexican, and all of these restaurants are all electric. And uh, again, I think Todd Bell can talk to it, but you can get walk fryers that are electric. You can get every every possible um, cooking device now is available all electric. And we're seeing, we do dining, you know, at our uh, tech campuses that we work on, they're going all electric. And the um, university dining facilities are also, I can't think of any that we're putting gas in any, anymore. So the last part uh, of my presentation, I just want to do a, a brief case study of a project that we're working on uh, with Gutman and Blavo at, up at Sonoma um, in Santa Rosa, at Sonoma Clean Power's uh, headquarters. It's a gut renovation of a wood frame building that you see featured here. And this is a project and a client, I'm sure you, uh, many of you know the folks at Sonoma Clean Power, their, their mission and charter was, is not only to provide electricity, but to really continually drive down carbon emissions in their territory. So they hired us to do a project that really was focused on carbon and showing how a project could um, achieve this grid harmonization or grid optimization and how buildings can be good uh, grid citizens. So we uh, brought in New Buildings Institute. They have a, something called the Grid Optimal um, Initiative. and It's a pilot program that is trying to help define ways in which buildings can be better grid citizens. And so this is the first pilot project for that initiative. That's a joint project with USGBC as well. So we looked, uh, this is another way uh, to look at um, kind of like it's showing similar thing to what the, the duck curve chart is showing. It's a visualization of the California grid across the whole year, January to December, midnight to midnight, and showing that um, at the, you know, during the uh, spring, in the middle of the day, you know, there's a lot of green means it's lower carbon energy. You can see the, the, the emissions rate up on the upper right. So there's, a, there's low carbon energy here and there's higher carbon in summer afternoons and uh, some other periods. So we really tried to understand when are we using energy and can we um, do some load shifting and load management so we can uh, improve our carbon performance. Um, we actually map the energy model data over that chart to really see where is our building um, um, causing greater marginal carbon emissions. So it's not only the summer afternoons, but actually with all electric heating, we have this morning warm up issue, right, in the winter. And I think this is something we'll continue to see more of as more and more buildings come on the grid. So. Um, so we were really focused there on load shape, not just net annual energy use, but load shape and when we're using energy during the day and trying to shift that through architectural measures and electrical measures. So here's a typical chart of a code compliant building in San Francisco with that in the in September with you know that peak coming at the at the wrong time in terms of when the grid 
has uh, clean energy. And uh, you know, different research studies have shown that you can use building measures to shift and lower that, that uh, peak load. And the measures are nothing exotic, right? You can see some of them listed here. Here's an example back from that Packard Foundation project. Something we did back then was um, shading a southwest facing facade. And back then we did it because it improves thermal comfort, visual glare, reduces energy use. But now that we understand the, you know, the premium of like that late summer day or early fall um, heat gain on a you know, south or west facing facade and how important it is, you know, this kind of strategy becomes even more important and it can be a really key piece of reducing those peak loads. So for Sonoma Clean Power, we had our base load reductions. We, we, we built a whole new envelope, all new windows. We insulated the building. We added uh, really great daylighting, skylighting, fans just to provide thermal comfort. But then we worked really closely with uh, Goodman and Blavoet, our engineer, to look at different measures that were targeted at those peak, the, the times we wanted to reduce energy use to reduce carbon emissions. So smart thermofusers that would allow control, temperature setbacks um, at, at peak times, lighting demand response, warming up the building earlier, like starting like at six in the morning to avoid that, that morning um, peak in the winter. And then of course, uh, the paired PV and battery array to really be able to kind of do that um, load shifting. As the project got to, towards the end of design, we started, as we all know, seeing these planned power shutdowns because of um, fires up in Sonoma. And so because we had the battery already, we started looking at what about islanding the building? And so we are gonna provide the opportunity for them to shut, shut off the building from the grid. And based on that relatively small, I mean, commercial size battery, but not a huge battery uh, with that small PV array on a sunny day, if they, they can basically, um, in an event, they can uh, kind of abandon the upstairs and part of the downstairs and just work out of this kind of emergency operations center. And they can basically work if it's sunny out and it's you know in, in the fall for most of the day, every day, continuously charging the battery with the PVs and having a great amount of resilience from this, this paired battery PV system. Um, my last slide is kind of a... Uh, uh, just to address a question that we get a lot, which is, isn't it less resilient to go all electric, right? Because what about these power shutdowns and what do we do? You know, we can't use the, um, um, you know, you can't heat your water, you can't cook. The reality is all new appliances these days, all new mixed fuel appliances, they have, um, they need electricity to run. So it's really no more um, uh, resilient to use a gas appliance. The old appliances, you could you could kind of put a match in it and start it, but that's not the case anymore. So I think we're seeing that the resilience afforded by um, electricity and using batteries is actually greater than having um, mixed uh, fuel. So I think I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions. I can't have answered all, all the questions in your head. Hi there. Over here. Oh, hey. Hi. Hey. Uh, Jason Crapo with Contra Costa County. Um, you made the point that a lot of projects are being built all electric just purely based on economics. Uh, what would you say has changed um, in recent years mm -hmm. that has led to that uh, you know, happening more frequently? I think a few things. Um, I think just you know, recognizing it, uh, really looking at, you know, if we really go all the way all electric and not just mostly electric, but let's have um, gas cooking, right? If you can eliminate the infrastructure costs, especially for new construction of bringing in those, those gas lines, and you really understand the financials, finances of that, it starts to pencil out better. I think the changing utility rate structure that is I think maybe already here or coming soon, when we do the analysis and, and understand um, these, uh, I guess that's more on the battery side I'm thinking right now, that 
that understanding that if we can pair PVs and batteries and do electric building, we can actually, there's a really great return on investment of doing these systems because we can take advantage of selling power back during these peak times. And I think the heat pump, the, the, one of probably the biggest, and again, I'm not an engineer, but the heat pump technology has come such a long way and the costs have gone down, the reliability is way up and just the, um, the kind of uh, scale of the heat pump, air source heat pump systems, it's, it's really much more cost effective than doing um, you know, in the past. I think that, that first net zero project we did in San Jose has a geothermal you know, ground source heat pump and they're cool systems, but they're expensive and they're a little complex. So I think the systems have really come along as well. Um, Danielle Mackis, City of Oakland. Um, I know that gas cooking is kind of the main issue, but we have heard a bit about um, needing an open flame in laboratories. So how did the labs and, and your examples kind of overcome that? Did they just not need an open flame for their activities or did they and find another solution? That's a good question. Um, they, they can just do um, um, like mobile, you know, tanks for, for like, you know, Bunsen burners and, and open flame. Um, and avoid just bringing all the infrastructure all the way through the building. So that's, that tends to be what it is. I think at LBNL, they actually, they still have brought gas to the building just in case, uh, kind of for future proofing in that case. But for our more kind of academic, you know, teaching labs and universities, they're just doing local tanks. Hi, Tara Glofshan out of San Jose. Uh, my question is about the PV combined with the battery. Yep. I talked with a uh, solar specialist and they mentioned that uh, the battery is not as efficient um, when looking at the cloud technologies they have to pull energy from the grid. Can you explain a little bit about why you're looking at battery paired with PV versus pulling energy from the cloud? Sure. Um, so what we're, uh, I think there's a few reasons, the, the, the cost side is that, um, first of all, I know when we, now when we pair PV and battery, you can actually get rebates on the battery system. So it starts to bring the battery system down. And I, again, I'm someone, maybe Danny or someone could explain that better. Um, the, the financial, uh, you know, the benefits as the utility rate structure is changing, which is really making peak rates to match this ramping period that Danny showed on the duck curve. Um, there's a significant financial incentive to be able to generate energy during the middle of the day and then sell it back in the afternoon. So the, the payback on your PV system actually, uh, we've seen actually get even better by pairing it with batteries. And of course, that's all based on the Energy Commission, CPUC, trying to figure out how to deal with this Ducker problem that's likely to get even more pronounced and a way to harmonize across across the day and the year. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Okay. Question over here from the webinar. Um, the question is, do you know of any barriers or technology issues for designing small all-electric buildings like accessory dwelling units, 300 to 600 square feet, I've heard that the code makes it difficult for very small buildings to be all electric and meet efficiency requirements. To be honest, I'm not an expert in small and residential, although I'm about to do it on my house here in San Francisco and tear out all the gas, so I will be maybe in a year. Um, so I don't know if others want to maybe address that question later in the day. Hi, Hannah Kornfeld with Ascent Environmental. I'm wondering for this slide in particular, mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about having the PV system, you're in both instances talking about on a sunny day, but when we're talking about an emergency situation where there could be a wildfire, I would imagine that a sunny day is not really realistic. So did you do any kind of modeling about how long a battery um, plus PV would last in that kind of situation? Yeah, and so, so Ted, who's going to speak next, actually did, did the modeling for this. Um, and it, as you can imagine, has a, a very significant impact. <laughs> so um, I think you can see, you know, so if we had no PV system, which effectively is, you know, if it's totally, over, you know, um, smoked in, 
the, the battery is only going to extend the uh, operating ability for about three hours. You know, that, that's how much the, that size battery can actually store. So it's somewhere between, you know, and, and it'll just be done after that one day versus continually kind of recharging itself. So I think it's a gradation. Um, a lot of the Bay Area, as you know, when we're having these power shutoffs, it's, it's not smoked in. It's just the power shut off, and it's tending to be in the fall when there still is significant solar resource. Um, so in those cases, it seems, and and we we've seen so far that there's some ability, uh, there's some amount of pre-warning, so you can then charge up your battery um, prior to that occurring, as opposed to let's say an earthquake, which. It's not necessarily, you could, the battery could be empty, it could be full, we don't really know. Yeah. Brad, just to yeah, follow please. on on that, it, it really comes down to how efficiently they're operating the building, if they go into emergency mode, or if they're very, you know, skilled at, at turning things off and being efficient, they can last that battery a lot longer. But the, the building will be able to island, so that will take that PV to contribution. We've actually looked at charging stations so we can do vehicle to um, our battery storage and, and operations for the building as well to kind of um, allow that future capability. But I have not heard anything mentioned about generators. And what saved the day on PSPS was portable generators. Mm -hmm. You have hospitals which have large generators as backups because of the intensity yep. of their work. Yep. Where do generators play into this whole equation? We're we're still um, installing generators on on you know critical care facilities. Absolutely, it still has has a role in it. Um, and Ted, do you want to take that one as well? Yeah, we we've done a lot of work with these generation systems. What um and in the emergency power shutoffs, most homes can get through with a significant size battery for days on end. If you pair it with a generator, you can extend that life of the battery, but using minimal generator and minimal fuel usage. Just to, the, most, the way most generators are sized and, and what's being sold on the market are completely oversized for the entire load of the house. If you have an emergency load panel on the building or even on you know, something like this, we've got an emergency situation, you can extend the life of that battery system out. What most generators run at, if you've got a you know, one kilowatt hour, uh, one kW generator, and you're only plugging in a couple of hundred watts of stuff to recharge, it's not running efficiently. So if you have that paired with battery, you can run that generator quickly, charge the batteries, and then utilize that power off the battery system way more efficiently. What I'm nervous about is all of the emissions from all these generators that are coming online right now. And, and I, I even had my own um, father-in-law get sold a $5,000 generator in the electric connection to his house before I got a look at it. And that's a third of the PV and solar battery storage um, cost that would have had a payback. These generators used for three days have no potential for payback. It's just emergency power. Christine, Christine Gregory, and are you finding that you are often um, putting batteries in your commercial buildings now as well as multifamily? Is it the norm? It's coming on so fast. Right now we have four projects with batteries. One, we just finished construction down in Santa Cruz, an office building, and they, they really wanted it for resilience purposes. We have, uh, I think, three more in design right now. Um, we haven't done any in residential. These are all office and um, school projects at this time. but. I think, um, so resilience is a key factor, but again, the, the, the finances are really attractive with the new utility rates. That's what we're really seeing. And if a, if a client is already interested in PVs, um, when we run the number or when the numbers are, are run, um, and if they're a, an owner that's gonna hold this building for you know at least 10 years, um, the, the, the paybacks are kind of in, we've seen them like in the like four or five year range. So I think it's driven a lot by just the, if, um, the kind of life cycle cost. And then as Ted's talking about as well, the, uh, the ability to have some amount of resilience 
for buildings that are not critical care facilities that you know will probably need a, an actual fossil fuel generator. Yes, um, I have a question about the uh, cost of building all electric. Um, I think everyone here is in agree. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me that it would be cheaper uh, to operate and build. But there are some lawsuits against jurisdictions that are doing bans. So I guess mm -hmm. what's going on here is somebody's math wrong. Um, is it you know more complicated than that? The lawsuits that I've understood so far are coming uh, from like restaurant associations. I don't know if there are other ones. Um, this is a developer, I believe, and they cited yeah in Sonoma uh, okay. uh, increased costs or something like that. Yeah. Um, well, I mean the numbers are. I mean we're. That's why I think that's why I like to show the actual project you're seeing. I mean, these are projects that are built that are happening where people are making those choices before there were the bans. And so you have to kind of trust that these people are, are doing it because th their numbers, you know, they're making it work out. I'm sure there's um, certain projects. I know there are certain projects where it won't work out. Um, I think there's also the, um, well, I think the cooking is still a, a, a challenge. You know, as I mentioned, the institutional owners are going to all electric, but if you're building a, like a mixed use building and you have a spec restaurant space, um, that's where I think we're seeing bigger challenges because you don't want to reduce your flexibility to entice a, a, you know, a restaurant owner who's going to insist upon gas. Um, but I, I just know from our experience in our projects and the projects we're seeing at this kind of commercial scale that we're seeing that it's it's cost neutral. Or, so, or you know, so I'm not sure about the folks who are, yeah, you know, whether there's other. Yeah, I didn't ask you to, you know, <laughs> lot the, the other side. Yeah, I, know. Just I mean, there's obviously strong interests at play that, you know, that would not want to convert away from gas. I guess that probably explains it. Here. Um, can you speak more to the affordable housing and multifamily and how those partnerships come about and how do property owners manage to um, retain the affordable rent even though the value of the property goes up with those um, electric assets? Uh, I don't think I can speak to it. I am not doing these affordable housing projects. I'm kind of showing it to you based on what, you know, collecting um, information from our peer firms, so probably not the best person to speak to that. Yeah, it, it's good that you're getting this information. You know, when I look at these these wonderful drawings, the first question that comes to mind is, what is the stuff underneath it that, you know, you'd understand to really get the detail on it? Because, um, you know, somebody would ask to run the numbers and they'd want to know, you know, really what the payback was and how you set things up. Is there some way on some of these that if there was a question that we could get to somebody who actually had the answers because at some point that's what's going to be needed. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that um, for all of these slides, you can see we've listed the architect, the developer. Um, so, and I think these slides are all going to be available. So I'm sure, for example, here you could contact, you know, Mission Housing or Methune, you know, and, and try to find out really what the numbers are. I think we've been connect the reason, We've been able to get these slides because there's a real network growing of, of people who are doing this or are trying to understand, you know, how to overcome challenges and also wanting to share lessons learned around successes because it's obviously important. And so we're seeing a lot of just kind of open sharing of that information and of the, the calculations, both on the engineering side and on the financial side. Um, so I'm also happy if there's a specific project, I'm also happy to help after try to direct you to you know, a project that's relevant to the challenges you're facing. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone.